What's up, everyone? Welcome to Zygreen Car Talk number 35. We are joined by Kevin from the Jabal and Cars YouTube channel and Chris, aka the Topher. And uh, boy, do we have a spicy topic today. It should come as no surprise now if you guys watch my previous podcast that all three of us own 2022 or 2023 uh, Subaru BRZs or GR86s. And we all track our cars, or we always drive them in high performance environments. And today's topic is a very kind of spicy one. Uh, a lot of people who have been driving their Gen 2 cars on track have been blowing up their engines. Like ever since the car came out, you know, just it was just a matter of months before this became a prevalent issue. It got a lot of social media coverage, um, and it, even in some situations, that coverage pressured Toyota into actually covering engine replacement costs for certain folks. Um, and I want to share today four different use cases, or I guess anecdotes from people within my own network who have experienced major issues uh, with their Gen 2 cars. But before we get into that, let's just talk about this problem, first of all. A lot of people have been blowing their engines on track after somewhere around you know, the 10,000 to 20,000 mile range. And what I've seen is it typically happens, you know, not, your, not on your first or second track day, but after you've uh, done a few mods to it, put some sticky tires on it and get comfortable with the car, typically it happens to more advanced level drivers. And before we get into some of the examples- Are you saying if I suck at driving, I'm safe? I'm not, we'll talk about, <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second in terms of, what categories I think we can sort of create and uh, talk about like the risk level for each category of not only car, but but driver who's piloting the car. Um, but I'll pause there for a second. I just want to get you, your guys' thoughts on how much do you know about this topic, given that you're both owners and how generally worried are you? So Kevin, we'll start with you. Well, I know this is a spicy meatball of a topic, that's for sure. There's been a lot of social media attention on this since the beginning, since the cars first came out, or rather within a few months of them coming out when this became um, a notable problem. So we did an episode a few months back, sometime last year, I think, and we all kind of agreed, not the biggest deal, and it's probably not going to affect you because it's, it's super rare. Now we see this happening to more and more cars. I've changed my stance, which is that, okay, I'm a little bit concerned now because back then, based on the data, we made the conclusion that we did. And now with updated data, I've updated my stance. At the same time, I would like to, I think we're gonna talk a little bit about the root cause and whether or not RTV could be the actual issue at hand uh, versus other causes. But this is a topic that I mean, we've seen posted, I mean, I follow the, the cars subreddit and I've seen a few examples get posted even recently. So uh, as someone that does track pretty regularly, I've done, I think 11 uh, full track days on my GR86 now. I have 6,000 miles and I tend to, I tend to go pretty, pretty ham on the track. I, I'm like, oh, oh man, maybe I'm up next. So. Okay. Chris, how about you? This feels a little bit like deja vu from 10 years ago with the 2013 FRS and the valve spring issues that they had to recall for. So I don't know. Um, I, I'm not as clear on the, the root cause of the issue or how like systemic or widespread it is. Uh, it's still kind of early too, but there's definitely a trend. I feel like every month or so we get an article posted by The Drive, someone blew up their GR86 and Toyota's not footing the bill. And I've talked to Toyota reps and I've talked to BRZ or Subaru reps and they say, yeah, we kind of handle it on a case, to case by case basis. But it seems like unless if you get some attention on social media or on articles or on websites, you're kind of out of luck. And a lot of people, have, I think, have had to foot the bill. Um, we've got a few use cases. There's another one that came up recently that got resolved after it got some attention on the drive. I think that was Luke and his uh, GR86 or BRZ, I can't remember. Yep. Um, but it was GR86 because it was a Toyota dealer. But yeah, it has me a little bit concerned. Um, I've definitely changed my stance in that I've lifted it and put all-terrain <laughs> tires on my car and 
barely pulling G forces anymore, <laughs> and, the, and the FL5 Type R is a track car. So um, I probably won't be tracking my BRZ as much anymore. I'll, I'll probably do a few autocross events. I think um, as a little bit of insurance, and we can get into this a little bit later, but I'm prioritizing frequent oil changes. And um, I've always put a little bit of liquid Molly in my cars, a little bit of the MOS too. And I, that, that seems to help some with oil starvation. So. Um, I think a really key thing that Chris just mentioned there is the G forces. So a lot of people seem to be concerned about RTV, but the oil starvation, my understanding is that this is, this may not actually be due to RTV. It may be oil starvation just due to holding lateral G's. That was also a problem with the first generation vehicle. Um, and I don't think that we, I don't think there were RTV issues with the first generation vehicle, unless I'm mistaken. There were, but I don't think they caused that many issues. And then they redesigned the oil pickup and that was kind of the thing that got a lot of attention. But ultimately, I don't know if, I think that oil pickup is kind of designed to handle a lot of RTV getting sucked up in there. Because and it's not just a mesh it. on like one side of the, the it's like multiple sides. So the RTV yeah. would really need to engulf the whole thing to cause oil starvation is my understanding. And, and with the first generation, it wasn't blown up to this proportion, to this degree, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, so I have a buddy, Ezekiel, he runs uh, CM Auto House here in uh, the Bay Area. And he has pulled so many Gen 2 oil pans to do the RTV uh, fix. And most of them had a lot of RTV stuck to the oil pickup, but none of them, well, not a whole lot of them looked like they were like more than maybe 50% blocked. Um, so I think to your point, Kevin, RTV from what I've seen, like if, if you don't resolve the RTV issue early on and you start tracking your car, it will definitely increase your risk of oil starvation. But I don't, I do not think that is the root cause that is leading to everyone's engines being blown up because um, I've seen situations where folks have gotten that addressed early on and they still, they've actually measured their, their, um, their oil pressure uh, at, with a, at a very sensitive level while on track and they still have problems. And it comes down to what you mentioned earlier about uh, sustained lateral Gs. And I think that to me seems to be like one of the major root causes here. So you gotta keep in mind these FA24 motors, I mean, it's a $30,000 car. It has a wet sump boiling system. It's not designed to, you know, run Hoosiers and go a hundred miles an hour through, you know, you know, some of these corners for five, 10 seconds at a time. It's just, um, that's not what these cars are meant to do. It's not until you get into much more expensive machinery like Porsche GT products, for example, that you get true, you know, dry sump boiling systems. But even, you know, that being said, there are plenty of other cars out there that seem a lot more reliable on track, um, Civic Type R's and, and so forth. And they have wet sump boiling systems as well. So I think at the end of the day, is it still is um an engineering or perhaps manufacturing problem one or the other maybe a combination of the two that is a lot worse in these engines than a lot of other sort of like consumer budget focused performance cars out there so with that being said i want to talk about some of the anecdotal information i've collected over the past um actually in the last 24 hours but these Breaking These news. problems happened in the last uh, few months to various people that I know. So I'm going to keep them anonymous. Um, we will refer to them as BRZ boy one, two, three, and four. <laughs> and are then, they all BRZs though, or are they GR86? No, so boys? I thought about this. We can. We, one of them drives a GR86, so I'll call him a GR86 boy. Um, so <laughs> let's get into it. The first one. Uh, BRZ boy number one. He daily drives and tracks his 2022 BRZ, almost 37,000 miles, very fast driver, never dropped his oil pan to inspect for RTV. He was three laps into his 13th track day when he lost power. Um, he 
clearly has rod knock based on the video that I saw. And this is just a side note, but right after that happened, Subaru Starlink immediately sent a notification, uh, I guess, to the dealer or to the manufacturer stating that his car lost oil pressure and also stating that it had a check engine light. So he's now in the process process of deciding what to do next. And I think this part's very important. Here are the mods that are on his car. He has wheels, tires, 200 treadwear, coilovers, brakes, and very, very minor aero, a very small rear wing. And this is something that I think is very important. Uh, and we'll get into it a little bit later in terms of what mods and what level of driver that these failures seem to be associated with. Okay, so that's use case number one. Use case number two, we'll call him GR86 boy. Also a very fast driver, that- I would say just as fast as the first guy. Um, same level of mods, I believe. It's just, you know, coilovers, 200 treadwear tires. I don't think he had any arrow at all, just the OEM GR86 arrow. He also blew his engine on the track. And uh, the dealer actually forced him to, to pay for engine replacement. So just to give you a little bit more context about this person, he's been tracking and modifying 86s since late 2012. So similar to you guys, he has a lot of experience with the first gen car. He actually owned three Gen 1s, and two of them were supercharged, and he never had any bearing issues with any of those cars, although he did blow two transmissions and a head gasket. Mm -hmm. Um, So he bought the second Gen car and was like, okay, I'm not going to modify this one that much because it's such a capable and fun car out of the box. He did 24 track days, 16,000 miles, and got rod knock. So after that happened, Toyota sent out a field tech to investigate the car. And what they said is that they noticed that the brake system had been used very hard. Um, Go figure. And uh, (laughs) the the bolts and nuts were tampered with. Like, obviously, everyone who tracks their car is going to have to replace the rotors and pads at some point. Um, And they also mentioned that the ECU recorded a very high miles per hour. Also, go figure, right? Then they took a sample of the oil and uh, analyzed it, and it came back inconclusive, whatever that means. And then the field tech recommended to him that he pay for an engine teardown. He rightly refused, and then this got escalated to the regional office, and they actually approved um, the teardown and reassembly costs. So he went forward with that, and they basically found out that all the bearings were worn, especially in cylinder number two. And then the field tech wrote up the report. Um, they ended up still denying the warranty. So he still had to pay for the parts, not the labor. So it's about $6,000 out of pocket. So he decided to go forward with that, but he also hired uh, a Lemon Law attorney. And uh, he has an open lawsuit against Toyota right now to get a full refund for all the parts and all the damages. And here's the funny thing. The attorney that he hired said that he won a case for the exact same situation for a different car last year. And the last thing I'll add here is that the report from the field tech said something along the lines of, oh, there's evidence of racing, misuse, abuse, lack of maintenance, and lack of oil based on those things that I mentioned earlier. So oil starvation. Sounds like oil starvation, absolutely. Okay, so let me go through one more anecdote here. BRZ boy number three. Th- this situation is a little bit different. He tracks his BRZ, also same general level of mods, also a fast driver. Um, you know, see what see what I'm noticing here. It's like all the advanced level drivers that seem to be having these problems. He did not have an engine failure. He actually blew up his fourth gear on track, and the field engineer denied the warranty due to um, an over-ret because they basically looked at the ECU and they saw that the engine was frequently in high RPM ranges. But according to the owner, he never over-revved the engine. Um, So this is another thing I want to talk about. It's like how can, um, I guess, the dealer or whoever is doing the, the inspection, how can they prove that just because the engine was reaching high RPM ranges, that this is evidence of misuse or abuse, right? 
Um, but anyway, in his situation, he got very lucky because the service manager at the dealership um, was a friend of a friend. And they they convinced the regional manager to approve a goodwill repair for the transmission with a $500 deductible. This one is a little bit different, obviously, because it's a, it's a transmission failure, not an engine failure. But I think what all these three situations have in common is that um, it, it all happened to fast drivers. It all happened to cars with mods with like the most important mod here was the tire, 200 treadwear tires on all three cars. Do you happen to know what kind of tires? Because an RS4 versus a V730. Two of them were on Kumho V730s. The third one, I don't know what he was on, but I would suspect it's a very similar tire. Okay. And Kevin, you and I both run Kumho V730s, so <laughs> knock on wood. Mine's now at the end of its life. It's low. It's pretty low grip. So that's my that's my saving grace right there. Time to switch to Prius tires. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, based on these three situations, um, and many other situations that that I you know where I don't personally know the owners, there's been a lot of pressure, especially on Toyota. So I read somewhere, and I can't find the I can't find the actual article for some reason, but. Toyota recently updated their their verbiage for the, the warranty policy for the GR86. And it basically says that warranty claims will be handled on a case by case basis with investigation done to determine whether the car was operated within you know, acceptable conditions. So they specifically state that taking the car to the track will not necessarily exclude the warranty. It really comes down to how that car, the particular car was used. And, you know, missed shifts, for example, would be something where, you know, Toyota could say, yeah, your warranty, your warranty is voided. Yeah, I so don't I think, know. Yeah, th this is really key. I think a lot of people are up in arms like, hey, this is super vague, case by case basis. What gives? Not cool. I think this is the best we can expect from a, a company like Toyota. The reason being, number one, they're, they're, they're saying that if you go to the track, you are not voiding your warranty. However, as we all know, things happen on the track and sometimes it's user error. So if you do a money shift, that's on you. That's not on the car, that's not on your warranty. So I think this is probably the best we can expect. And I actually think it's, it's very fair, very reasonable. The question is what they are going to do after this statement, what kind of judgment calls are they gonna make on a case by case basis? I completely agree. It, it's completely, it seems to me that it's completely at the discretion of the dealership you take it to and who actually does the inspection or the investigation. And, you know, basically like, if you're able to, as, as the owner, if you're able to really make a case for yourself and try to get this escalated, if they try to deny you, then you have a better shot, but it's really going to be, your mileage may vary and you have to be very careful about what steps you take once this failure happens. Like for example, my friend who just blew his engine yesterday, who is BRZ boy number one, he um, he's thinking about, you know, basically turning some like putting some of his stock parts back on the car. But here's the thing. I don't think he should have to do that because the, the warranty clearly states, or at least the Toyota warranty, he has a BRZ, but that's beside the point. The warranty states that you can track your car as long as there's no evidence of misuse or abuse, which I agree, it's very vague. But he has never money shifted his car. He's never, I'm pretty sure he's never exceeded the red line. So if they look at that and then they're like, okay, and then they inspect the car and see that, you know, the the, the brake caliper bolts were removed at some point, is that going to be enough justification for him, for them to deny his warranty claim? That's where, that's where I'm like, yes, I appreciate that the, the warranty claim states that tracked cars are not excluded from warranty coverage but at the same time it's like what does that really mean well counterpoint is that hey you put on aftermarket coilovers and wheels and tires which is not directly related to the engine however this now provides higher g-forces and with those higher g-forces the engine is not designed for that and therefore we're going to void your warranty claim for that reason that's that's a very good point i don't know if it's fair or not it just it just it just a it is a point that they could use as a counter argument to say hey 
even though you think your wheels and tires are totally kosher f for this engine failure, actually they're not because we're discovering that it's the high G-force that's causing the issue. This, the thing I don't like about all this is the ball's very much out of your own court. Like you are at the mercy of the discretion of the service manager, your local rep, um, and that sucks. Hopefully and you live close to a cool one. Otherwise, yeah, exactly. Well. Send send them a right. gift basket, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, I would be nervous if I were tracking my BRZ or G86. Right I now. am nervous. And, yeah, no. that's one reason I kind of stopped as we started to see a few of these edit <laughs> failures, and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, one thing is you can always kind of factor in the cost of a new engine after X amount of track days. Uh, I mean, race teams do this all the time. They just replace the engine after so many race events, sometimes one, <laughs> you know? Um, and you can always go online and go on eBay and get a motor from a wrecked car, but you don't know what's been done to that. So, ultimately, there's there's probably an issue here with oil with the oiling system and um it'll take some time to figure it out maybe with the refresh maybe with the next generation we'll see a more reliable powertrain it seems like the fa20s were a little bit more robust and bulletproof to this type of abuse like i never had any qualms about taking mine to the track uh, i had 200 treadwear tires on my car i probably did 20 track days in it over the years and I didn't have an oil cooler. I changed my oil frequently, but I didn't get it, let it get too hot. I ran higher weight oil on track days. I did all the right things, but I had a 2014 BRZ and it was very stout and it's still running strong with over 120,000 miles on it right now. I did the uh, I had a 2013 FRS and I also did a lot of autocross and then track days. And um, I do recall that there were a lot of uh spun rod bearing issues with those engines and i actually had to do the valve spring recall as well so my car was affected i took it into toyota they totally butchered it it was it was not good um i had to take it back into the shop and then they fixed it and it was actually fine for you know forty thousand miles after that until i sold the vehicle and um one thing i would like to talk about fenton if it's if i don't mean to divert the conversation just preventative and reducing the risk because Chris has mentioned a few things that he's doing. And I think a lot of the things that we do in life that we enjoy, there's inherent risk. Anytime, like I went cycling this morning, there's risk. I can get hit by a car. We go to the track, you can crash into a wall. There's always risk. So I think what the internet tends to do, it tends to polarize and you tend to be black and white thinking. Obviously life is lived in the gray area of the nuance. So when you track any vehicle, there's going to be a risk of failure with these engines. It's going to be higher than, than normal, but is it, you know, is it a hundred percent chance? Absolutely not. So what can you then do to minimize that risk is the question. And I agree with a lot of Chris's preventative uh, maintenance and just uh, being a little bit more on the, the cautious end of things. So number one is not using zero W20 on track, but five W30. Number two is if you are, unless you're like literally a super beginner or in a super cold climate, I think that getting an oil cooler is worth the investment. On my FRS, I had an oil cooler. On my GR86, I got an oil cooler before my first track day because I tend to go pretty hard. Um, doing regular oil changes, more regular than you think you may need. Better to be safe than sorry kind of thing. Uh, the cost is pretty low. Plus the liquid molly as well. I started adding that um, per Chris's suggestion, actually, to my GR86. Never did that on my FRS. And... Baffled oil pan I hear does not really help, so I have not done that personally. Um, again, based on my understanding of the RTV issue, I don't see as much benefit to dropping my oil pan and and, and trying to clean it up. Um, what are you guys' thoughts? So I, I will say that in perfect topic, because this is the next thing I was going to talk about anyways. Um, I will say that if you want to be as careful as possible, um, then you should do all of the above. You should actually, I would say you should drop your oil pan. You should take care of the RTV because that's, it, it is such a common prevalent problem that it, it just gives you peace of mind knowing that your oil pickup is, is at least, you know, clear and free of debris. Right. So Especially I can think you have like 10,000 miles or more, a few track yeah. days in your belt, you know? Okay. So you guys do think that, that dropping the pan and inspecting the oil pickup is, is probably worth it. I think it's worth it because 
it, it's not the easiest DIY job, but it's certainly doable if you just, you know, have a jack and some jack stands at home. And if not, you know, I know uh, my my buddy Ezekiel um, at CM Auto House, like he does these basically on a weekly basis. And it, it's not like a thousand dollar job. Like it's something that's, you know, relatively affordable in the grand scheme of things. And if it prevents, uh, you know, $12,000 engine repair bill, why not do that preventative maintenance, right? But here's some easier things that I think you should do even before you do that. Absolutely get rid of that 0W20 OEM oil. Um, put in a quality 5W30. I'm running uh, Pennzoil Ultra Platinum Full Synthetic. So I've seen very good test results from that, um, and it's affordable. Um, I think the I think you're right about the baffled oil pan. Um, I know one person who tracks his GR, GR86 uh, very heavily, and he uh, he actually did. He's a person who I, I alluded to earlier who measured his or tracked his uh, oil pressure during like various laps um, at the track, and he saw that with the baffled oil pan. Um, I believe it was like during sustained cornering, like high G cornering, the oil pressure was still dropping uh, well below what he would consider like comfortable. So I don't know how much that's going to matter. I mean, th it wouldn't hurt to do it, but I, I don't think that seems to make a big difference. Um, I agree about the oil cooler. Even though these Gen 2 cars come with a you know factory oil cooler, it's not like going to work. Yeah, that, that's the, what is it, water to oil rather than the air to oil. And it's it's it helps it warm up a little bit when the engine's cold and it helps cool it just a little bit. But it's it's for track usage, it's essentially useless. I'll say that if you if you track your car in 80 plus degree Fahrenheit weather, that oil cooler is not is not going to work for you. Like you, you it also definitely... depends on, your, on how you drive, though. Because there's, there's, I do a lot of my track days out here in Vegas. It's hot. One of the guys has a GR86 and no oil cooler. He's cooler than I am. He's also a little bit of an older guy. He doesn't drive as hard as I do. So if you're bringing the engine out to redline with every shift, get an aftermarket oil cooler. I think that, that yeah, I, I agree. Like if you're a beginner driver and you're not really pushing the car that hard, you'd probably be fine. But my first couple of track days, I saw my oil temps, and this is in like 60 degree weather, mind you. I saw my oil temps get up to around like 255, 260. And so, you know, think, you know, 80, 80 degree Fahrenheit ambient temp, you're probably going to be pushing like 270, 280. And that's like right at the limit of what I would consider acceptable. So I think doing the oil cooler is... It's another relatively easy thing. I would say like the labor on that's probably going to be similar to dropping the oil pan and doing the RGB. So those two things I think would really go a long way. I think I think the the dropping the oil pan for RTV would probably be less. I think I got charged like three hours of labor for the Jackson recent oil cooler. Um, okay. I did that on both FRS and GR86, and I've been happy with the Jackson Racing one. Not sponsored, but hey, Jackson Racing, if you want to sponsor me, hit me up. <laughs> Yeah, I have the color fittings uh, oil cooler, and uh, technically I am sponsored, but it works for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and then uh, what is the other thing? So, yeah, the other thing is, honestly, unless you unless you are doing, you know, time attack, or hell, even if you are doing time attack, like I know 8.6 Cup here in the Bay Area or here in California, there's classes, right? But you can run a lower grip tire, like a Champiro SX2, and be in like one of the lower classes, still have a ton of fun. And with that low grip of a tire, you are at, I, what I've seen is you are at significantly lower risk, even as an advanced driver, because you're just pulling much less lateral Gs. Um, so I would actually say that, I know it kind of, it pains me to say that, but if you just don't mod your car to be as grippy, like hell, even keep the stock suspension, you might be in a much better place. But, um, and Chris, I, I know you've taken basically this approach with with your car now. After lifting it and like you know putting some all terrain tires on it, you can slide the hell out of it. Like it's still a lot of fun. So ultimately, it's probably like point eight G max now. <laughs> right. If that's what you're going for, then you know what, like you know why why modify your car to be something that it ultimately is not you know, going to hold up to. Yeah, I think the tires 
tire suspension is is super critical. Um, I think a lot of people, when they see that someone else is going faster than them on a certain track, they say, oh, I need to improve my car. And I don't think that they think as frequently as they should, oh, I need to improve my approach on certain corners, right? Maybe it's the, the, the driver rather than the vehicle. And by taking on that mindset, I think you can keep it at stock suspension, SX2 tires, and again, lower your risk, but still have a lot of fun, still improve as a driver, still have, have a lot of the benefits of tracking. Not an ideal solution, but it's, um, it's not the worst thing ever either. It sucks because we want to make these cars, they're kind of underdogs, right? We want to make them fast enough to pass Porsches, to pass S2000s, to get out there and like be like kind of little Miatas where they're all, you're always up someone's tail. And the new platform is really fast. The power from the new engine is great. If you put an oil cooler in there and it maintains lower temps, it holds power through a session. Whereas in factory form, it kind of heat soaks after a few laps. But there's this like cool thing to be able to go out and buy this $30,000 car and track it and upgrade it and make it as fast as a $50,000 car, especially if you're a good driver. And that's really appealing to a lot of people. But at the same time, I've always kind of been a proponent, proponent of not modding your car too far outside of its intended purpose. And I feel like the intended purpose of the BRZ, the G86, has always been low grip, high fun. And going back to what we were talking about earlier, think about the parameters in which the engine was designed to operate in. And if you're pulling 1.1 G around a corner, you couldn't expect some oiling issues. So in that case, you may want to upgrade to like an SS1 LE or something that is track capable, track ready right out of the factory. And, you know, if you're wanting to go fast, if you're wanting to do time attack or competitive events, getting a vehicle that can really, really last on track, uh, like a $10,000 NA Miata where engine replacements are a thousand bucks, you know? So. Or if you really want to get a new car and do, you know, those types of events, uh, and keep it under thirty thousand dollars. Get a Miata, like a, a new Miata, like an NT2. They, those don't seem to have major issues, as far as I'm aware. So there, there are other options to your point um, that you can get, you know, and, and that will probably fulfill your needs in the long term as a track car better than the BRZ and GR86. But I agree, it, it is, it is really frustrating because I've always been like exactly that type of driver that you described, where like I like to be the underdog, like in the lower power car. It's so much fun. Car. Yeah, it's so much fun. And, you know, that's why I had, you know, multiple S2000s. And um, I think this is a really interesting fact for some of you, uh, you know, track junkies out there. One of my friends, uh, he has a very heavily modded AP2 S2000, um, full aero, you know, full, you know, two-way suspension, et cetera, uh, even the tune and, and full bolt-ons. And his best time at Buttonwillow uh, is a one minute fifty five second. Right, that's that's blazing fast for a car with well under three hundred horsepower. Before he blew his engine in the BRZ, he did. He was on track for a low one fifty eight second in a in a car that has one way suspension, uh, less drippy tires, Kumo V seven thirties essentially no arrow just you know very very basic arrow and like uh previous gen brz performance pack brakes so if you put the same level of mods on the brz as you put on an s2000 i think the brz would be a little bit quicker and that's that's saying something because the s2000 has always been like that underdog car that can keep up with basically anything in the corners so the urge is there for me to like always drive the brz like just to the ragged edge and like keep up with you know probably lesser drivers and things like ss1 le's or gt3s even but the more i'm seeing these issues happen the more i'm like maybe i should just you know back it off a little bit and focus more on kind of just like leaving the limits of the car itself a little bit lower and just focusing on improving my driving skills within the boundaries of what the car can do yeah. 
it's, it's, I think it's something for, for all of us. I think and just two weeks ago when I was talking to Fenton about this, I was like, oh, hey, yeah, I want to get coilovers. I want to get like even stickier tires now. I want to hit like these certain times on these certain tracks. I want to hit sub sub two on uh, on Button Willow. And um, I think a lot of us, we're competitive. We like going fast. We like pushing our cars and ourselves. You can still do it. You're just going to have a higher risk. And, it, and if you are willing to eat that risk and say, hey, if I'm going to, have these engine problems, I'm fine with the consequences, I may have to pay out of pocket, more power to you. The next question that comes up for me is, okay, so you do have some engine issues, what do you do? <laughs> like, uh, This is now happening frequently enough that I'm not sure if there's enough data points to say what are the best and worst practices. One thing I've always thought of is like, if you go to a dealer and they say, you're out of luck, we're not doing this, can you take it to another deal and get a second opinion like you would a doctor? <laughs> You know, that's a great do question. People do that. I um, think once it's in their system, they may use that to be like, now, like, why, why are we going to do more work and have more expense when these other people already inspected and they said, no go. That's kind of my take too. Like, I don't know the actual answer to that question, but you know, all these situations like Blake and Luke and others who have had these problems, and and one of my buddies, if it was as easy as going to another dealer, they would have done that. Right. But clearly sure. they ran into dead ends. So I'm going to venture to say that, yeah, like Kevin, probably like they are tracking this in a system somewhere. And any dealer who runs your VIN is going to be like, OK, yeah, th this other tech already denied you. So we're not even going to look at your car. Yeah, probably have the, maintenance, the maintenance records are all connected because I've I've done maintenance on my vehicle at different dealerships and they all it's all in the same spot. They, they have the, the full records. So another thing with regards to preventive maintenance, but it's actually more of like damage control. Always record when you're on track because if you can record two things are gonna happen. Number one, you can prove in video whether or not there was user error, whether or not you money shifted, right? Number two is unfortunately negative press helps with um, getting the outcome you want sometimes. And if you have a video that can then be shared on online and be like, hey guys, look, this is what happened. I wasn't doing anything crazy. There was one recently where this guy was just doing like a cool down lap or something and then his engine failed, right? That's gonna get shared, that's gonna get more negative publicity and then Subaru Terra is like, okay, this is bad for sales. We should just eat the cost because this you know, building bigger and bigger uh, is discouraging more and more people from buying our vehicles. Let's just handle this so that it doesn't get out of control. Yeah. Agreed. Um, I completely agree with that. And here, here's like maybe a thought experiment. Like what parameters do you think that in an I ideal world, like whoever's doing the investigation on your car after an engine failure, what parameters do you think they should look at to determine whether or not your car was, was misused? So in, in my opinion, they should look at your engine RPM. So if, if you over rev the car, that's on you. Right. Um, Secondly, I think it would be cool if they actually could have a log of your oil temps. So if they if they see that you're hitting 300 degrees Fahrenheit regularly, I think that's a great uh, that's a great reason to deny your, your warranty claim because the car comes with an oil temp gauge, and if you're not watching it, and watching it, and you're letting your car overheat. Do that, like that's. The, the car is not meant to to to, to operate in those conditions. But I'm I'm curious what else you think, what you guys think um, would be worth looking at. Yeah, I mean, in factory form, the car has one or two good hot laps in it before it gets too hot. That's it. Brakes, engine, everything gets too hot after that. Um, and then when you make upgrades, you can extend that, but not by a whole lot. So, you know, you still want if you're going out for a 20 minute session. You want to do a hard lap and then you want to do a cool down lap and you want to maybe take a few medium laps and then do another hard lap and then Oops. do a cool down lap. I just, I do my warm up lap, may, like usually just one, and then I just go ham for the next 20, 25 minutes and then I do one or two cool down laps. And, uh, and then I'll do like, I'll drive around the paddock for like another five minutes and I'll stop the car and I'm like, oh my God, my pads are still smoking. And then I'll like drive around for another five, 10 minutes. Like, this is not good. This is not good. Mechanical sympathy, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> you need a little more. <laughs> but I mean, here's the thing. You can do that with a Porsche and expect minimal issues. You can do that with a Camaro SS1 LE, expect no problems. You know, you can do that with some cars. And 
go crazy, but they're usually big money. You've got to kind of temper your expectations with, with this platform, I think. So maybe there's only so, so long you can get away with that. Yeah. But that's what I've always done when I track my BRZs and I've, I've never done like huge break upgrades. I've never done an oil cooler because that would be a pain here in Michigan with winters. Um, so I've always just kind of managed my heat myself and just gone out for quick sessions here and there and kind of up and down, up and down. So almost time attack tile style where I'm like waiting and waiting, waiting, then going for a hot lap, then waiting a little bit, backing off, then going for another hot lap, trying to beat I my I find time. that really, really hard to do myself. Um, Me too. There's times I'm like, oh, let's, let's go nice and easy. And like, I still end up pushing it ham <laughs> because I just, uh, I think track time is very limited and then even getting a clean lap is also not the most common thing depending on how busy that track day is on that day so like i will just try to go fast every single lap and then maybe here and there i'll get a couple clean laps in um it's worked okay f for me so far with the exception of my my brake rotors have been getting warped and i had my um the owner of one of the local shops here that's that specializes in gr86 and he's like dude you just need a big brake kit like you go Cause I'm like on off switch with like, I'm either not breaking or breaking full force kind of thing. I would, before you go full, full big break kit, I would recommend DVA 4,000 rotors. Maybe you should try that. That'd be a lot cheaper. Like those solved fade issues on stock pads for me. Really? Like the cooling capacity of those rotors, just get front DVA 4,000s, order them from tire rack. They're a little pricey, but they're, they're well worth it. Slotted and drilled. Worth. So they are slotted. They have like internal cooling kangaroo yeah. paw technology. And uh, it's it's just disc brakes Australia. You get them for like a 2014 BRZ GR86. I don't know if they have them out for like the new cars, but it's the exact same size. It's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kangaroo right. paw technology. I'm already sold. I'll try it. Kangaroo paw technology, and but you they have said little you... pouches for the air to be mm. thrown out and extract the heat. So w w when you said that you got rid of fade with just those rotors, were you, were you on stock? uh post sport fours or primacies let's see i did a track day on them with my re71 rs tires on stock brake oh. pads because i i ran through my um my uh, porterfield r4s pads which are still the porterfield r4s pad is still a, like a street pad so it's not that much of an yeah. upgrade from the stock pad and i had no fade issues and that's, that's consistent insane. with my last BRZ too, because I ran those rotors on the last car too. So, um, wow. but the, the extra cooling, like the answer used to be, go just get cheap blank rotors. Cause they're going to warp. They're going to get worn out quickly anyway. Well, if you want to keep your brakes cooler and you don't want a big brake kit, this is kind of a little hack that I recommend to anyone who's tracking. So I'm going to try that next. It, I, yeah. Gavin, you even more so than than me, I think you should probably. I've gone through many have, many rotors on both my F four S and my G R eight six. Don't worry. I mean, sometimes I drive uh, viewers' cars on track. Don't worry, guys. I go a lot lighter on your car on track. <laughs> have had any issues with any? Yeah, major disclaimer just for me because obviously it's my car. I feel comfortable just pushing it to the limit every single time. But yeah, I should I should try that. Depends on the track too, but I would, I mostly track at Gingerman Raceway in South Haven, Michigan, and it's a super hard track on brakes. Like I've barely owned any cars that can handle it stock without fade. Like the only cars that handle it are, you know, carbon ceramic supercars or you know, track ready stuff like CT4 V Blackwing or you know. S2000 with a uh, with just some brakes and, and fluid, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, but but between high temp fluid and those rotors, I you'll be in pretty good shape. So going back to your original question about um, what the car company should look at, what Toyota or Subaru um, should look at, I mean I think what you mentioned makes sense. Like if they could look at oil temp logs, that'd be helpful. Um, over revs. Um, because you, you want to you control for user error. So what, what account for user error is like you're not shifting correctly, you're um, over revving, doing money shifts, you are running the car too hot. Um, I think having a video again is very useful in that case because then I'm on my cooldown lap, my engine's failing, what's going on here? I did nothing wrong. Um, especially if you have that whole session recorded as well. So it's not just the 30 seconds that where the failure happened, but the whole session. Oh yeah, he drove fine. There was no, no issues. Um, 
And then if it does happen to you, what do you do? I, I think on one hand, we've seen that posting about it on social media can help get more attention and then help sway the car companies. However, I'm not sure if that should be your first, like you should first try to pursue, I think, um, more private, like I would, I would pursue more private avenues first and just discuss my various options. That a lot of these guys have gotten from these engine failures, like kind of would suck. Mm -hmm. So yeah, well, I think you should it's only... probably going to suck a lot less than having, having to pay 13 grand out of pocket though. I'm just wondering if there's, if there's instances where had that person kept things private, they would have a better outcome, but by going public, they somehow shot themselves in the foot. So it's like, it's, you can't put the cat back in the bag for that reason. I would, I would personally first try private avenues before I even consider posting about it publicly. I haven't seen any situations yet. Granted, I haven't done a ton of deep research on all the use cases, but every like social media instance of this happening that I've seen has resulted in, you know, the dealership or the manufacturer covering it. I don't know if you guys also, have seen otherwise. I do want to just say and mention here, we don't have a ton of data points. We have kind of a consistent, like small trend that we've noticed already. There are a lot of people out there who haven't said a damn thing and they're tracking the heck out of their cars and just, they're fine. So it's gonna take time to get more data to see if this is a consistent trend, if this is a real problem. Like I would like to see a thread with 200 engine failures before I really call this like a systemic issue, you know? I, I do think it's 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 happened frequently enough that I, I definitely think this is a this is an issue now. Like I, I'm convinced it's an issue. When we talked about it last time, eh, there's only three instances or whatever. Now there's way more than three instances that we know about publicly. There might be some additional ones. And I don't think we, we need like 200 to say that's an issue. I think that we just need to see a pattern that this is significantly more common in this vehicle versus other vehicles to say this is a significant problem. We could probably say it's a little bit more common than previous generation cars. It does seem that way. Ap like after 2013s. Right, mm -hmm. it does seem that way. I mean, I, I mean, again, I, I'm, I'm kind of like in between you guys. I think, you know, 200 instances, probably not necessarily, but also I think right now it is a little bit early, but all I can say is that like anecdotally speaking, the two fastest drivers who I personally know with these cars have both blown their engines in the last six months. I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, I, and not, I, I'm at the point now where I'm like, okay, my car is probably a ticking time bomb. I haven't tracked my car as frequently as either of those two guys because they're at like 13 and whatever, 24 track days respectively. I'm at 10 and I feel like this is gonna happen to me sooner or later. So, you know, if I keep going down this path that I'm going down, which is, you know, now I've got, you know, running 255 section with V730s, I've been tracking on 225s. Okay, let's talk about the different categories of drivers and cars that, that we can lump everyone right, into. If you're a crappy driver, you're safe. Don't worry about you're it. You're safe, yes. <laughs> Unless you money ship because you suck, because then you're not. Yeah, safe. That's actually <laughs> Don't be too crappy. Yeah. <laughs> But I would say that there is kind of the outlier in the minority group, which is the folks that I'm talking about. Um, and I think all three of us would fall into that group if we tracked our cars regularly on 200 treadwear tires. Heaven, you and I do. Chris, you're a smart man, smarter than us, and you are just having fun going sideways at low speed. So good on you. So that is that the, wisdom, though. Yep, yeah, that is the most high risk uh population i would say the medium I put population. A tow hitch on my car i'm i'm turning mine into a, a suv there you go <laughs> it's the sports car utility vehicle it's an sc uv a whole new genre of vehicle i basically <laughs> to survive on michigan roads i need to raptorize my brz and it, it won't like you know if it falls into a pothole it'll have the ground clearance to get itself out and hey, it's got two rear seats, so you you put your child seat back there. You're set. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So much I'll wiser like, man than us. I'll be in the winter. I'll be like recovering school buses that are stuck, spinning their tires in the snow. <laughs> My. 
Strat only had a symmetrical all wheel drive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the middle, I guess, mid wrist population, I would say is more the beginning beginner track drivers and, uh, actually situations like yours, Chris, where like you are a very high level driver, but you're not modifying your car to be extremely grippy. So end of the day, not pulling high lateral G's for a sustained amount of time. I still maintain like kind of the most fun way to drive these cars is on the stock Michelin primacy tires, because it really trains you to be accurate and precise. And when you get it wrong, or when you make a little mistake, hundred feet back, you kick out sideways and you have to correct and it's easy to do. And one, you're not hitting high lateral G forces Two, those tires last forever. Like you can't wear them out. Even if you try, it's ridiculously frustrating to wear out a set of Michelin primacies. Um, that's, and you, they're cheap. You just go buy them used. Everyone's selling theirs because they don't have any grip. And, um, I don't know. I, I had a great battle first track day out with my BRZ with a Cayman S a nine, eight, seven, one Cayman S. I think I saw that. And he was pushing and I was pushing really hard and until I hit brake fade. Cause I didn't have my DVA 4,000 rotors. And it was a blast. Cause I was like, Oh, you know what? He's on sticky 200 Trevor tires and I'm on eco Prius tires and I'm keeping up. And this is a blast. And it was very sideways, yeah, very loud. Let's say drivers, real, though. That's, that's just the drivers. That's like yeah. a, it <laughs> it was a good driver. driver, too. You know, but it was also like, it was that hero moment of like, under. I felt like an underdog in some ways, too, without maybe putting my car at, you know, at as much risk as I would have with uh, high sustained Gs. Because at Gingerman, there's a really long right-hand sweeper where you're pulling over a G through the whole thing. Mm. And it's like, so it's like a sustained G for like, I did, I think, one or two track days on the original Primacy tires because mine is mine's the same as yours, the lower trim. So it came with the Primacy rather than the PS4s. And I just remember being very frustrated by understeer. So like it would understeer and then oversteer, understeer and oversteer. And it just had to be, I did not have any camber, no. So that would have helped. Um, but also just like the limits are just so low that... I couldn't run an advanced group. I had to run in like intermediate group and an intermediate group. I think it's actually more dangerous because there's people that for sure probably be still in beginner group, but they're like, I'm, I'm intermediate now. It's like, okay. And, um, you know, there's like more shady things that happen. Whereas now with my V seven thirties and advanced group, like again, a lot of it is, is driver as well, but these cars with 200 treadwear tires, stock suspension, just the front camber bolts, like, I'm overtaking some C6, C7 Corvettes. I'm like, you know, it's 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 a quick enough car that you can hang. Agreed. That's a good point too. You guys gotta remember, I, I haven't done a public track day in like forever. We have these private track days that we do and there's like two people out on track. So Must be nice. Not, not really fair. <laughs> Top tip, uh, if you have a track that has reasonable rental fees, like just get a bunch of your friends together and go. Out. Yeah, I have some friends who do that. I have yet to join them, but that's the way to go because then you, yeah. you basically have like an open track day with yeah, no so we just open lapping. So you can go out for 10 minutes and then come back in and then yeah. wait 15 minutes and go out in someone else's car and you know, whatever. It's very free. I'd be so whatever. down to do that. So down. Yeah. It's more yeah. expensive usually, but it's you get way like the seat time to dollar ratio is actually much better than your average uh you know public track day. Oh yeah. really? Yeah. Yeah. Like you will tire out before the end of the day and you will quit. Like that's, that's my, been my experience with, with open track days. Okay. So just going back to the, the kind of risk level categories, if you will, my conclusion is that if you're not tracking your car, don't even really worry about this. Cause you're not, of course not. Yeah. yeah, you're fine. Like, so like the, my point is we're not trying to scare everyone who has a BRZ or G or eight, six. It's only the top few percent of people who are tracking their cars really hard, who are really seeing these problems from what I've seen. Now I'd love to know in the comments, like if anyone knows of situations where daily, like purely daily driven BRZs who have not been, you know, money shifted or whatever, have actually seen engine failures as well. From what I've seen, I, I don't know of any. Yeah. All the stories, all the stories we're hearing are like, 
autocross track days. It's mostly track design, not autocross. Like that's when these issues are happening. Me too. I don't know how you can like autocross is usually not that hard on the car. You're not holding sustained G's. It depends on how long the corner is, but normally they're like like last a second, you know, two or three seconds here or there. So that was the subject. I'm you know just curious what what everyone out there thinks. Um, you know, it's only been a like what a year and a half, a little bit more since these cars started you know hitting. Uh, you know, customer hands, and we've already seen a number of engine failures related to track work. Hopefully, Subaru and Toyota are able to address this somehow. I don't know if they can come up with a facelifted version of these cars that have this engine issue resolved. You know, personally, I am I am very skeptical or not optimistic, I should say, because these flat four Subaru engines have been you know kind of notorious for one reason or another for failing. For the past, I want to say, 10, 15, maybe 20 years now, and it seems like an inherent problem with flat four engines in general. You know, I'm, I don't know the technical details of it, but uh, yeah, I mean, if this car came with an inline four engine, maybe that would fix it. I don't Higher know center of gravity. Can... Yeah, I mean, there are pros and cons for sure, but uh, I do have yeah, one more thing know. to add. So I mentioned this to Chris the other day. Um, most companies are gonna make a relatively accurate decision regarding what helps their bottom line. If this becomes such a substantial issue that they start seeing the sales of the vehicle decline because the reputation is so bad with the, rep the reliability of the engine, then they may be forced to take some additional steps to, to remedy that. Until that point, the company is not in, like the company is in the business of making money. So they're going to do everything they can to keep more money in their pockets. And the reason that we're seeing these social media, um, these reports when they blow up, then they, they get it fixed is to curtail that. So if this does become a bigger issue, there could be a higher chance that the manufacturers do step in in a, in a better way to limit any damage for their, their reputation to the vehicles. Yeah, I mean, if I think if you were to look at this statistically, like even though we're talking about all these situations where this has happened, as a percentage of overall sales, it's barely on the radar, most likely. And from a bottom line perspective, why go out and completely redesign an engine just for the top three? Well, no, no, counterpoint, because it's it's only a couple couple cars. For, for Subaru or Toyota to eat the cost of just fixing you know, a handful of cars, engines here and there is infinitesimally small, who cares? But even if it is a, you know, just 10 cars that has happened to it, it's been more than 10 cars, I'm sure. But the reputational damage is massive because as humans, we're terribly illogical. That's why a lot of us are afraid of flying and not afraid of driving, right? Textbook example. So. It's not about the actual math as to how often is this happening. It's about the perceived reputation. I get comments on my GRA6 videos all the time about, hey, are you concerned about RTV? Oh, I wouldn't get this car if it didn't have RTV issues. How many people actually even track the GRA6s? And out of those who track it, how many actually have issues? So it, the actual risk of it happening to an owner is low because most owners don't even track. And out of those who track, it's still a small minority. But the reputational damage can be massive. You know what, what you're saying now reminds me exactly of the IMS bearing issue of the old Porsches, like the 996, 997 generation, the, before they moved to the 9A1 engine code, I'm, I'm getting geeky now, but I mean, I own two Porsches with engines that had IMS, the intermediate shafts, and I was scared shitless um, of failure in both cars, and in hindsight, I shouldn't have been. Because if you actually like try to dig into it and try to find some numbers on it, you're it's like exactly as you explained, the percentage is so low, but the reputation of those cars has just been absolutely shattered over the last you know 10, 15 years. And, it, and that's evident if you look at the market values of those cars. Like from a driving dynamic standpoint, and like like the car itself, when it works, is a fantastic driving experience, but the prices are like not even half of what the later generation cars are for that one reason alone yeah 
So and and of course now for the viewers to to make sure that we're all on the same page, neither Fenton or I are arguing that the manufacturer should care about the resale value of the cars. However, we're early on in the actual generational uh, cycle for the GR86, right? It's what two years old, not even. So they're going to be making this car for several more years. So then that reputational damage could influence sales for the next several years. I, I just think... read some rumors that in 2025, they're going to switch to the Lexus IS platform, probably a shortened version of that. Turbo hybrid three cylinder. Turbo three no! cylinder the GR Corolla. Give me naturally aspirated lightweight. <laughs> with hybrid torque fill. With no manual transmission, unless they. Uh, oh, they'll make keep the that. manual transmission. With a hybrid. Mm -hmm. well, are you talking about a true mechanical manual or that new thing that their Toyota and Lexus are working on that's a synthetic manual? I'm sure it'll maintain a manual transmission. It might even keep the same transmission with some upgraded components. But yeah, the rumor is that the next gen BRZ or next gen GR86 will change platforms to a Toyota platform and have the turbo three cylinder from the GR Corolla with hybridization with like a torque fill. And a help fill with the, the, the turbo lag. Yeah. So the, the response was hybrid and they could do manual there because they had like that sandwich kind of design with the, the Oreo filling. Um, It'd be like the hybrid would be in the transmission housing or the electric motor would be like within the transmission housing or, you know, the flywheel or something. So, dude, I'm all for that. That sounds that amazing. Cool. Yep. Yeah. It, so. I mean, if they're able to, to adequately limit the issues with, you know, turbo lag and such with the, the hybrid technology, but then the weight becomes an issue and sounds like a bigger, heavier car. Doesn't sound that like, sounds a, like a 30, 3,600 pound car at least. Yeah, still like lighter that. than the M2. That's true. The M2 is lighter than the M2. Yeah, everything's lighter than yeah. the M2. 3,900 pounds with an automatic. Oh, yeah. That's My other house was lighter than the M2. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> All right. I think we've uh, we've belabored this topic. Um, yeah. Again, we've beaten this I, dead horse. We, we have indeed, but so I, this is probably the last time I'm, I'm going to talk about this unless something drastic happens, you know, I want to see a, more data. I want to see a little bit more time happen and, and kind of see where we end up here maybe in a year or so, but I do, I do think the pickups and, and report our findings on the next, on the third episode of GRA six BRZ boys or TV issue. You know what? I'm personally probably not going to drop my oil pan until like warranty's about to expire because that could also be an issue if you have to make a warranty claim is oh you dropped your oil pan you got your you know oil pan resealed you broke into it mm -hmm. shame on you you should have done that, that warranty so denied bad. how terrible would that be if they're like oh my that would be terrible dude that'd be so bad it's kind of a damned if you do damned if you don't type thing yeah. yep so well okay. said the level of outrage would be next level for that. <laughs> oh, you tried to make your car more reliable? Well, you're getting punished for that, buddy. I also just heard of a case today. Um, I was talking to someone at this car show, and they had had a 2013 FRS that they bought from a like a Buick dealer used. And on the drive home, the engine blew up. And Ooh. it was... It was like out of warranty, you know, as is, bought as is. And the dealer, he took it back to the dealer and the dealer was like, yeah, you revved it over 4,000 RPM. You revved it over 4,000? <laughs> so you guys were asking like, what's the rev limit? Okay. At this Buick dealer, it's 4,000 RPM. Yo, yo, I know we're trying to wrap things up, but there's, there's all, another really important thing that I forgot to mention, which is that how much of this could be attributed, whether it's, you know, not, not any specific, not all these instances, but, you know, maybe an instance here or there, just not treating your car properly. Uh, on, on the track, I also see people like, they don't do a warm up, they just like gun it. I'm like, bro, your engine is not up to temp. Your brakes are not up to, like nothing is up to temp and you're just gunning it. That's not good. And then I see people who just like, they start the car up, you know, take it out of the, the driveway and they're just like red line. I'm like, your car's fine right now. You keep doing that, it's probably not gonna be fine. So, not everyone's a like hardcore car enthusiast, you know, they, a lot of people just abuse their cars because they don't know better. This is where I was going Mechanical earlier, like, I, I would love to see, like, in the future, as 
as these cars get more technology te technologically advanced is just have better um data logging. I guess, and yeah data logging and so, i mean we're already in a, in a place where your car is sending an automatic notice to the dealer or manufacturer when you get a check engine light and the location in a location exactly so it's like of info. It, it's not going to be long from from now i think or i at least you know maybe i i hope to some extent um where there will be much more precise data logging in such a way that it'll be a much more straightforward decision on whether the warranty like should be voided or not there's probably no specific like requirements for hey if we see this no warranty claim if we see you know under these circumstances you're covered so it's it's super discretionary and it's up to a case-by-case -case basis which sucks because even if you're doing all the right things you could still get denied True. Yeah. there's some subjectivity to it yeah exactly but again it comes down to like just minimize your risk minimize your risk like let your engine warm up do your preventive maintenance do do all those things guys this is a lot of fun this is this is a great chat there you go end of the day if you can't afford uh to, to, to pay out of pocket for a new engine i would recommend just not tracking your brz or gr86 sure period yeah and with that on that lovely note <laughs> my personal Zai financial advice to all of you viewers out there. Um, but anyways, would love to hear what, what you guys think about this problem. Are we missing anything? Uh, is there a thread out there? I haven't seen one that just tracks every single failure. I would love to take a look at the data and see how that uh, changes over time. Um, but otherwise, follow both of these guys on their YouTube channels. Again, it's uh, Jabal and Cars and the Topher. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Real quick. If you guys want to see some more podcast episodes and you have some requested topics, please let us know with a comment down below. If you watched to this part of the video, you, I'm hoping that you enjoyed it. Um, I know that I definitely enjoyed it. It's great chatting with these guys. They're really knowledgeable, really cool dudes. So um, yeah, guys, Fenton, thanks for having us. Great time. Great chatting. Awesome. See you guys later.